Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And Deputy Prime Minister, Minister Fu, Professor Tan, Professor Mabubani, and distinguished guests. It is a great privilege to be here at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, particularly this year when the people of Britain, indeed the people of the whole world, stand with you in remembering the father of your nation as one of the foremost statesmen of our time. Lee Kuan Yew didn't just chart the destiny of modern Singapore, he created it with his characteristic energy, determination and vision he took Singapore from independence 50 years ago and made this country one of the greatest success stories of the modern world. And by inspiring economic reform across the Asia-Pacific region, he helped to write not only Singapore's history, but Asia's too. Margaret Thatcher used to say there was no prime minister she admired more than Lee Kuan Yew for what she rightly called the strength of his convictions the clarity of his views, the directness of his speech, and his vision of the way ahead. I had the privilege to meet him myself back when I was opposition leader, and I was struck then by the same characteristics and by all he had achieved. So I think it is absolutely fitting that there should be a school of public policy in his honour, and it's a great honour for me to be invited to speak here today. Now I've come to Southeast Asia with a very simple message, and it's this. Britain is back, and Britain means business. We've taken the tough decisions to deal with our deficit and rebalance our economy, and it is growing faster than any other large advanced economy on the planet last year. We've seen the largest fall in unemployment in our entire history, and more jobs created in Britain than in the rest of the European Union put together. We have met and will continue to keep the vital promises to spend 2% of our GDP on defence and 0.7% of our gross national income on aid, so we are playing and we will play a leading role in advancing security and prosperity all around the world. And we're more focused than ever on making our own country one of the very best places in the world to do business. It's in Britain where we have the joint lowest corporation tax in the G20. It's in Britain where we're stripping away the red tape and where I've said to my ministerial team, if you want to put a new regulation in, you have to take out two first. It's in Britain where you benefit from a time zone where you can trade with Asia in the morning and America in the afternoon, where you'll find the easiest access to the European market and where you'll find some of the best universities anywhere in the world. And I make no apology today for talking up what Britain has to offer because I want Britain to play a bigger part in the success of this region too. For too long, we've been too reliant on our European neighbours for trade and investment. Now, of course, we must do more to make the EU more competitive and to cut EU regulations. And those are some of the reforms I want to bring about through my renegotiation of Britain's membership. But there is a world beyond Europe where Britain must not miss out, and nowhere more so than here in Southeast Asia. It is a striking statistic that Britain still does more trade with Belgium than with the whole of Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam combined. Yet ASEAN is rising rapidly. When I visited three years ago, it was the 12th largest economy in the world. Now it is the seventh, predicted to be the fourth largest single market by 2030. Later this year, the ASEAN Economic Community will bring together over 600 million people. It's a consumer market with as many smartphone users as the whole of Europe combined. It's an infrastructure market where the roads in Malaysia alone already stretch further than the circumference of the earth. It's a digital market where there are more tweets from the city of Jakarta than from any other city on our planet. And it's a cultural market where there are more supporters of Liverpool and Manchester United in Southeast Asia than in the United Kingdom. Indeed, there are more supporters of Manchester United in Southeast Asia than there are people in England. <laughs> I want to seize the opportunities to trade more with these incredible, vast markets. That's why I've chosen ASEAN as my first major trade visit since the election. 
It's why I'm the first British Prime Minister to lead trade delegations to Indonesia, Malaysia twice in three years, and the first British Prime Minister ever to visit Vietnam. It's why I've brought with me a plane load of business people from every region of the UK, the gateway to the EU, right here to Singapore, the gateway to ASEAN. It's why I'm not just encouraging British business to look beyond their trading, traditional trading destinations, but urging other parts of the world to look beyond where they might normally invest in Britain. So for the first time, I'm holding a Northern Powerhouse event right here in Singapore. Now, people might ask, what's the north of England got to do with the southernmost tip of continental Asia? Well, we are rebalancing our economy, and the opportunities are immense. A new job is being created in the north of England every six and a half minutes. It's home to at least 23 universities, all brimming with research and development opportunities. Sunderland, in the northeast, makes more cars than the whole of Italy. And it's home to companies like Future Everything, which just won a contract to bring its festival for digital culture, culture from Manchester right here to Singapore this autumn. And I want all this to be the beginning of a whole new scale of trade and investment between Britain and Southeast Asia, a partnership that can drive our shared prosperity for decades to come. But Singapore and Britain share more than a commitment to greater trade and investment, as important as that is. We have a special friendship based on a shared history and, more importantly, a shared outlook on the world. It's what President Tan described on his recent state visit to the UK as a relationship of old ties, new links, and more opportunities. Ever since the founding of modern Singapore by Sir Stamford Raffles as a port for free trade and enterprise almost 200 years ago, we've shared a commitment to open markets, free trade, enterprise, and innovation. And from the influence of British common law at the heart of your legal system, to the UK's role in creating the Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau, we've shared an appreciation of what I call the golden thread of conditions that enable countries to be successful the world over. This really matters, and it's key to explaining the success of both our countries. Democracy, the rule of law, free speech. I would argue that these things are not just good in themselves. They are, in the long term, key to economic success as well. They underpin innovation, creativity, and choice, because those things require investment and risk-taking, and that only happens when people can be truly confident that their property rights will be respected, that their ideas won't be stolen, that the legal system won't suddenly find against them in favor of a corrupt elite. In short, we both believe in a rules-based world order with fair and accountable institutions and open and fair rules to boost enterprise and growth. Now, of course, there are challenges in delivering that. A truly meritocratic system has to mean equal treatment for all, regardless of race, disability, religion, sex, or sexuality. A rules-based world order also demands not just freedom of expression, but also a free press that can attack the government. And that can sometimes be uncomfortable for those in office, as I know myself. But the better informed the public is about the issues affecting society, the easier it is, ultimately, to come to sensible decisions and to develop robust policies that command the confidence of the people. Of course, there are market economies in closed political systems. But the best way, I believe, to ensure that an economy delivers long-term success, and that success is felt by all of its people, is to have it overseen by political institutions in which everyone can share. One of the most understated but most important elements of a rules-based world order is a commitment to transparency and to tackling corruption. No one understood this better than Lee Kuan Yew. It was his commitment to tackling corruption that helped to give people confidence to invest in this incredible country. And it's no coincidence that Singapore's climb to the top end of the global indices for anti-corruption and for ease of doing business have gone hand in hand with its great global economic success. And that goes right to the heart of the argument I want to make today. I believe world leaders together need to show the same leadership in tackling corruption that Lee Kuan Yew demonstrated here in making Singapore so successful. Let me explain why. 
Think of all our efforts to drive global growth, and then consider the fact that corruption adds 10% to business costs globally, and that cutting corruption by just 10% could benefit the global economy by $380 billion every year, substantially more than was estimated for the entire Doha global trade round. Then think of all our efforts to tackle global poverty, and then consider what happens when corrupt governments siphon off all the benefits and proceeds of growth that rightly belong to their people. Think of all our efforts on the other side of the world to rescue people drowning in the Mediterranean, and then consider why those migrants are there, fleeing in many cases from corrupt African states where they have no economic prospects because everything is controlled by a corrupt elite. Think of all our efforts to combat international terrorists like Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, and most recently, of course, ISIL in Iraq and Syria, and then consider how an oppressive and corrupt government can drive its people into the hands of extremists in the first place. Corruption is one of the greatest enemies of progress in our time. It is the cancer at the heart of so many of the world's problems. It affects everything, from a family's ability to send their child to school to the credibility of the world's favorite sport, football. And yet, when it comes to tackling corruption, the international community has looked the other way for too long. We simply cannot afford to sidestep this issue or make excuses for corruption anymore. We need to step up and tackle it. Now, I know there are some who won't agree with me. There are the skeptics who will question whether we can afford to take the lead on corruption without putting our own economies at a competitive disadvantage. And then alongside the skeptics, there are the defeatists. They get the problem, and they get the concept of leading the charge to tackle it, but they just don't think there's anything we can really do that will make a big difference. Now, countering these arguments is absolutely critical to developing the kind of global effort that I believe we need to overcome this great enemy of progress. So let me take each of these arguments head on. Let me start with the skeptics. Those who ask whether we can afford to tackle corruption are, in my view, asking the wrong question. The right question is whether we can afford not to tackle corruption. First, there's the moral argument. Taking a stand against corruption is clearly the right thing to do. Corruption runs completely counter to our values. It rewards those who don't play by the rules. It creates a system of patronage where the resources are shared out by a small elite, while the majority are trapped in poverty denied the benefits and proceeds of growth that are rightfully theirs. Now, this is fundamentally wrong, and we can't just look the other way while it happens. It says something important about the kind of country we are, that we stand up for our values, that we expose those who try to defraud others, and we don't stand for corruption at home or abroad. That's why in the last parliament we established the Independent Commission for Aid to ensure that our aid money is spent where it should be, and why we've taken action to suspend, to suspend support to a number of countries after corruption scandals. But tackling corruption isn't just morally right, it is economically right as well. Companies that become complicit in paying bribes find that they face higher costs. They embark on contracts that may never be honoured. They operate in a false environment that can change suddenly and dramatically. And they incur reputational damage for being complicit in a corrupt system. Acting to stop that, as we did with, in Britain with our Bribery Act in 2010, shouldn't have to damage business, jobs, and growth. In fact, the effect can be the absolute opposite. As we've seen in Britain, and as we've seen here in Singapore, where tackling corruption hasn't held back growth, it's actually boosted it. Let me explain why. Over the long term, it is societies that create and enforce simple, stable rules that will attract the high-value investment. This, in turn, means that instead of limiting their investment to low-value, low-risk parts of a supply chain, investors are prepared to risk more of their money, share more of their projects with partners, and innovate more. Of course, commerce depends on many things. It depends on rules, on markets, on products, on customers. But for a large market to flourish, whether in Europe or in Asia, it also needs an element of trust. 
trust in the rules and trust in the implementation of the rules. And all those act to create trust in those you don't know. Now, corruption undermines all of that. It makes it riskier to trust strangers. And that doesn't just undermine business. It erodes the bonds of society more broadly, too. So we simply cannot afford to ignore it. But what about those who think there's nothing we can really do that will make a difference? What about the defeatists? They throw their hands in the air and say, well, this is just the way of the world. They say, yes, maybe we can tackle corruption in some countries, but it's too deeply ingrained to defeat it across the globe. Well, of course it's difficult. The most important things so often are. But I would say, look at Lee Kuan Yew. He didn't accept that sort of defeatism, and neither should we. When Britain first set out to create a partnership of countries that would make commitments on transparency, what we call the Open Government Partnership, many people doubted it would amount to much. But today, 65 countries have made over 2,000 commitments on transparency and openness, from pioneering citizens' budgets in Liberia to letting the public audit major government projects in the Philippines. It's making a difference. When I first put good governance at the heart of my co-chairmanship of the UN high-level panel, when we were looking to replace the Millennium Development Goals, some doubted that we'd get agreement to putting tackling corruption at the heart of our international approach to tackle poverty. But that is exactly what we've achieved. With the new Global Goals that will be launched in New York this September, we're set to secure for the first time a concrete commitment to reduce corruption and bribery in all its forms. And not just that, to promote the rule of law and ensure equal access to justice for all, to reduce illicit financial flows, strengthen the return of stolen assets, and combat organized crime, to build effective, accountable, and transparent institutions and representative decision making, and to ensure public access to information and to protect basic freedoms. All those things are going to be written into the new global goals. This is a fundamental change to the way the international community fights poverty. And if the world can live up to these bold commitments over the next 15 years, then we really will have a chance to end extreme poverty and build a better life for all. Now, we've seen with all such agreements, winning the argument is only half the battle. Action wins the war, and I'm determined to do just that. But again, to the defeatists, look at these arguments. When I put tax, trade, and transparency at the top of the G8 agenda for the first time back in Loch Erne in Northern Ireland two years ago, many thought this would just be a flash in the pan, another one of those communiques, words that don't really mean anything. But today, over 90 countries, including Singapore, have agreed to share their tax information automatically by the end of 2018, meaning that more people and more companies will pay the tax that is due. At the same time, we're also working with the OECD and the G20 to finalize an international plan to stop companies from artificially shifting their profits across borders to avoid taxes. So I don't accept the defeatism. What was a big issue for many people has now led to real action on the global stage. These changes can happen. In fact, we should use the progress that's already been made as a spring for, springboard to go even further. And a key area I believe we need to focus on is transparency of business ownership. Who owns what? As The Economist, Paul Collier, has noted, lack of transparency over who owns companies, and I quote, not only assists tax avoidance, it is the key vehicle for corruption. Why? Because when you have companies whose ownership isn't known, you allowed a shroud of secrecy behind which people can do bad things, sometimes terrible things, with no accountability. The corrupt, the criminals, the money launderers, they need anonymous company structures to hide, to move, and to access their money. So by lifting off this shroud of secrecy, we can expose wrongdoing and dissuade others from going down the same path. Now, this is a challenge for everyone, including ASEAN, including Britain. We too must get our own house in order, and we are. And that is why the UK government has legislated to ensure that from next year, Britain will become the first major country to establish a publicly accessible central registry showing who really owns and controls all British companies. This will open up a new era of corporate transparency 
in Britain. But of course, it will only apply in Britain and for British companies. So the aim should surely be for others to follow. To really tackle corruption effectively, we need to be able to trace data from one country to another. We don't want criminals to be able to go unnoticed just because they move money across borders and have assets in different countries. The torchlight, the spotlight, should be able to follow them. If we're to win, we must make sure there's absolutely nowhere to hide. So I'll continue to make the case for transparency with international partners, including the British Overseas Territories and Crown Dependencies, and I'm willing to go further and take concrete steps to force the pace. And that includes looking at whether we can get foreign companies investing in the UK to step up to the same level of transparency. Now, with £122 billion of property in England and Wales owned by offshore companies, we know that some high-value properties, particularly in London, are being bought by people overseas through anonymous shell companies, some of them with plundered or laundered cash. Just last week, there were allegations of links between a former Kazakh secret police chief and London property portfolio worth nearly £150 million. I'm determined that the UK must not become a safe haven for corrupt money from around the world. We need to stop corrupt officials or organised criminals using anonymous shell companies to invest their ill-gotten gains in London property without being tracked down. People like convicted Nigerian fraudster James Ibori, who owned property in St John's Wood, Hampstead, Regent's Park, Dorset, all paid for with money stolen from some of the world's poorest people. So we've got to find ways to make property ownership by foreign companies much more transparent. There may be a number of ways we can do this, for example, by extending what we currently ask of UK companies to foreign companies too, and we will consult on the best way forward. But as a first step, I've asked the Land Registry to publish this autumn data on which foreign companies own which land and property titles in England and Wales. This will apply to around 100,000 titles held on the Land Register and will show for the first time the full set of titles owned by foreign companies. And we'll also look carefully at the case for insisting that any non-UK company wishing to bid on a contract with the UK government should also publicly state who really owns it using the government's buying power as a, if you like, battering ram for greater corporate transparency around the world. So let me be clear. The vast majority of foreign-owned businesses that invest in property in the UK are entirely legitimate and proper and have nothing to hide at all. They are welcome in Britain. Indeed, I want more of them. We are one of the most open and welcoming economies anywhere in the world. And I want Britain to be that country. But I want to ensure that all this money is clean money. There is no place for dirty money in Britain. Indeed, there should be no place for dirty money anywhere. That is my message to foreign fraudsters. London is not a place to stash your dodgy cash. The challenge I'm laying down for every country today is to root out the rot of corruption, to ensure transparency over what your own companies are doing require transparency for foreign companies in your country too, and work with us to spread this approach to transparency around the world. This will be a vital part of the anti-corruption summit that we'll host in London next year, a summit where I hope the whole world can work together to strengthen all the tools that we have to take on corruption, to put fighting corruption at the heart of our international institutions, to support the investigators and prosecutors who can help bring the perpetrators to justice, to maximise the way we use international aid to drive better governance and to fight against corruption, to make the rules and practices which govern global commerce even more resilient to threats from corruption, and to give more support to those in business, in civil society and the media who are working to fight corruption, like the ASEAN Corporate Social Responsibility Network, which Britain is supporting to promote best practice among local businesses right across the region, including in Burma. Together, I believe we can defeat the cancer of corruption in all its forms, and with it strike the biggest blow for our generation in the struggle to ensure greater prosperity and greater security in every part of the world. To see it all through will take the leadership that Lee Kuan Yew embodied, but there could be no greater prize 
and frankly, no more fitting tribute to his memory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We've got time for questions. If you uh, put up your hand and say who you are and where you're from, um, in, the, in the interest of transparency, I will uh, answer your questions. Starting here, sir. Uh, my name is Anthony Teo. I'm a young professor in the school. We all agree with you. I agree with you. And Lee Kuan Yew with uh, Go King Sui in the Harry J. Jo Johnson Memorial Lecture uh, established that quite a bit in terms of the intellectual feel of it. But my question is more to you in terms of the future. Yeah. And that is, Lord Hillsham, when Tony Blair won decisively, told the Tories that they will be out in the wilderness for 10 years or more in the Carlton Lecture. And he must be smiling because you delivered it. <laughs> but now you are in your second term. And Tony Blair is thinking that if his January Corbyn wins, he <laughs> will be out in the wilderness for 20 years. <laughs> so the issue is, <clears throat> you have three elections to lose. And where is the succession strategy? Because as investors, people look at where yeah. the continuity is. Thank you. Well, I think... Um, uh, I'm a great believer that politicians shouldn't make too many predictions about the next election or the election after that. Um, uh, and, and the truth is, each election is an individual event. And I always say to my team, look, it's fun to watch the opposition when they're making a mess of things, and it's fun to talk about their leadership election. But at the end of the day, we have a serious job to do. We've got a great country to run. We've got a brilliant manifesto to implement. We've got a growing economy, and our figures are out today for the last quarter, growing again, 0.7%. You know, we've got a great track record, a strong manifesto. Deliver that, and we'll go on winning elections. And that is what we should focus on. So focus on your own job. Don't worry about the opposition. And then people like Tony Blair and others can make us many predictions as they like. My, and, and, uh, yes, you ask about this. So I've um, already been Prime Minister for five years. I've said I'll be Prime Minister for the next five years. I'm in the prime of life. I'm fighting fit. I'm loving my job. But I don't think anyone should go on forever and ever. And I've got an incredibly talented team. Some of them are here today. I won't embarrass them by naming them, or that'll set off all sorts of speculation. But one of the things I've tried to do is actually appoint, obviously, talented people, but then keep them in post for a long period of time so the team can really demonstrate um, its capabilities and also demonstrate its capabilities to overseas investors. I want people to see Britain and see we've followed a consistent plan. Not just a consistent plan of getting the deficit down, getting the economy growing, having low tax rates to attract investment. Not just a consistent plan, but a consistent team. And so uh, that's what we've got. And that, I think, can, if, if we keep performing and we keep delivering our manifesto and we keep doing the things we said we would do, then Britain can be a success story and my team, the blue team, can go on succeeding for many elections to come. But I make no predictions because uh, not my, that's not my game. Who's next? Sir. Now, I'll take some questions from the press. Where are you all? Got you over there. Very good. Yeah. Kishan Mabubani, Dean, Lee Kuan Yew School. Thank you very much for speaking at our school. I hope this is not too difficult a question. Uh, <laughs> you know, we support your cause on corruption all the way. Singapore does it. But there's something called legal corruption. And it's, you know, in the United States Congress, it's possible for United States corporations to pay for the elections of politicians who then write legislation mm. which then benefits the US corporations which paid for their elections. Mm. That's all legal. How do you solve this problem? Uh, you're right. Look, first of all, <laughs> it's a difficult question. Um, <laughs> but it's absolutely relevant because if we look at some of the fines that have been levied, you know, they really are absolutely massive and can be, you know, they go beyond punishment, which should be about deterrence and retribution. They almost go beyond that. And so I think this is a, a problem, but it's a problem, frankly, 
uh, every country has to ask itself. You have to ask yourself, is my legal system and the fines that it delivers, is this actually in the long-term interests of the health of my economy? Does it, will it encourage um, inward investment? Is it fair between different companies? Uh, and I think that there will be those in, in the United States who will, who will ask that question. I think it's absolutely right. Um, that you know, wrongdoing by companies is punished and punished properly. And we've done that in the United Kingdom. We've, some of our financial services firms have paid big penalties for poor behavior, and we've taken that money and we've spent it on very good causes. But it should always be proportionate. It should always be reasonable. It has to pass a test of reasonableness. And so I think it's a very fair question you ask, but I think every country has to ask, is what we're doing not just convenient in the short term, but is it right in the long term? One of the questions I often put to people uh, when you're looking at a country to invest in is you should ask, how often does the government lose in court? And this sometimes sounds like an odd question for a prime minister to ask because it's very annoying when you lose in court. But actually, it's essential to demonstrate you have the rule of law, you have an independent judiciary. And, you know, I think that is one of the strengths. When I, well, our argument here, really, is that Britain and Singapore, there are lots of reasons for our success, the hard work and determination of our people, and all the rest of it. But I would argue one of the reasons for our success is the rule of law, democracy, independent judiciary, a fair adjudication of things. Those things give investors certainty. Those things are crucial to our success. And one of the reasons for making this argument is, of course, there are countries with open economies but enclosed political systems. And I think some developing countries might look at them and think, well, maybe that's the shortcut to success. And I think Britain and Singapore and other democratic countries with the rule of law should stand together and say, no, long-term success is more likely to be delivered if actually you do the hard work of entrenching your democracy, entrenching democratic institutions, having the rule of law, even though it can be inconvenient and annoying when the government loses a court case. So we should be proud of our democratic and legal values uh, as we talk to others in the world about the paths of development they take. And that's where this argument about corruption fits neatly and squarely into that, into that space. Some questions from the press. Let's have Faisal Islam from Sky. Uh, Prime Minister, these were very strong words about the London property, uh, well, the UK property market. When did you first realise that the British property mar market, market may be mired in dirty money? And is there not a danger that uh, all that will happen is that uh, com these companies will be reincorporated in places like the British Virgin Islands, which are an overseas territory, which is refusing to take part in your overseas register of companies? Well, well there's two bits to that. First of all, I've long been interested in to make sure that deal with what I call the cancer of corruption. And that means you've got to have proper exchange of tax information. It means you've got to have more openness about ownership. And I haven't just talked about it. I've actually put it on the record at the G8 and got things to happen in terms of exchanging tax information. And also in the first country in the world to set up a register of official ownership. And obviously, I think it's very good if we can take action on property as well. Um, so there's a track record of, of taking action. Look, to those who say, well, this won't work until everyone takes part, well, you've got to start somewhere. And frankly, you know, a few years ago, people thought, well, there'll never be a register of beneficial ownership. Well, now there is. A few years ago, people thought, well, countries like Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories will never join into this agenda. Well, they have. They've agreed to the exchange of tax information. So look, this is a battle that is going to take years to fight and win, but arguably I think we've come further in recent years than anyone predicted, but only because certain countries and certain people are providing the leadership um, uh, required. But it'll be a long battle, and there'll be lots of people along the way who say this, uh, no one will, 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 will join into it. Well, actually, they are. Every one of those Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories have agreed to the automatic exchange of tax information. That is going to mean raising more tax revenue. It's going to mean, uh, you know, uh, great benefits for, for uh, tax raising authorities around the world. So I'm not a defeatist or a skeptic. I actually think we can make a difference here. Let's have uh, Wintour from The Guardian. As a matter of public policy, in the light of the Sewell case, uh, do you think there is a, now a case for you going further than what you would proposed in your Conservative manifesto about Lord's reform? And given your commitment to cutting the cost of politics, will you still go ahead with your dissolution honours list, which will take the House of Lords 
to a size that's um, probably the largest second chamber anywhere in the world, over 800. Well, first of all, let's be clear, in the last parliament, we made some very important progress, which is actually we passed a law so you can expel people from the House of Lords um, if they behave inappropriately. That did be the case. That is now the case. Uh, and so Lord Sewell, who seems to have absented himself anyway, could have been subject to the new power. So that's point one. Secondly, on cutting the cost of politics. The main way we're going to do that is by reducing the size of the House of Commons from 650 down to 600. That is happening through the boundary change and I think that is uh, worthwhile and right. On the House of Lords it is now possible uh, for people to retire from the House of Lords and a number of people have taken up that option under the Steel Bill and I think we should encourage that. In terms of the House of Lords and appointments to it, look, I regret the fact we didn't achieve House of Lords reform in the last Parliament but it's quite clear to me that there's no point trying that route again but it is important that the House of Lords in some way reflects uh, the situation in the House of Commons. At the moment it is well away from that uh, I'm not proposing to get there in one go, but it is important to make sure that the House of Lords more accurately reflects uh, the situation in the House of Commons. And that's been the position of Prime Ministers for a very, very uh, long time and for very good and fair reasons. Next one over here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your vision. I, it's, uh, I wish you all the best in Britain. I think it's exciting. My question comes from democracy, rule of law consistency as well as transparency underpinning the approach that you are taking on in this anti-corruption drive. In ASEAN, we have varying levels of democracy, Singapore included. How would you ensure whether it's under the business and human rights or under the corporate social responsibility banner, how do we ensure that companies both ways, British companies here and our companies in Britain, really work to a model and what's the governance that you think you could propose? Thank you. Right. Well, we have now, uh, you have in Singapore, quite clear rules for public companies Uh, for the sort of uh, corporate citizenship that they should afford, and I think that's important. I think that, uh, but the law can only go so far. What we need is to have the correct laws in place, but then also to have the culture change that goes with the law. And here I think there is a real change that's taking place, I would say in the last five to ten years, and it's a change over taxation, which is, you know, since the politicians rightly started addressing the issue of companies shifting profits around the world so as to artificially deflate uh, their taxes. Um, and since we've started addressing the things that need to happen internationally so that tax authorities share this information, since that started happening, I think the conversation in the boardroom has changed and the culture is changing and that companies who were up to now quite understandably asking how do we uh, pay a, a minimum tax rate uh, because we should try to maximize our returns to shareholders, companies now quite understandably are asking, well, what is the reputational risk from what we do? So let us make sure we obey the law, tick, but also let's make sure we're not exposed to reputational risk from artificial shifting of revenues uh, around the world in order to artificially minimize our tax bills. Now, I think that's a very healthy change. So my, my political philosophy, if you like, can be summed up in one word, responsibility. Now, government's got its responsibilities to pass laws and to make sure we govern. But we can't change the world and improve things without other people exercising their responsibilities. So you need corporate responsibility, you need civic responsibility, you need personal responsibility. And I think corporate responsibility has a big role to play in improving the state of the world and solving some of these problems. It should go with legal change, but it's a culture change that needs to happen. And I think, look, I, I, make this, I think it's good that someone on the centre-right makes this argument. I am pro-business, pro-enterprise, pro-low taxes, pro-entrepreneurship. You know, I know the importance, the vital importance, that a strong private sector and small business sector plays in our economies. I'm an absolute free market man, free enterprise man through and through. And I think it's good from that position to make arguments about corporate social responsibility because this is not an argument that's about beating up on business. This is an argument to say that culture change should go with legal change 
And in the end, we'll all benefit from that. Fighting corruption will be a huge benefit for business if we can get this right. Let's have another question from the press, from the BBC. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, wouldn't new or higher property taxes on foreign buyers deter crooked people and companies from hiding their money in the UK? Uh, and here in Singapore, it's very difficult for foreigners to buy property. There are all sorts of restrictions. You have to be on a register, for instance, uh, and you have to be a permanent resident. Are you tempted by that? Well, I think the problem with that is if you put up taxes, and from time to time we have put up taxes, but if you put up taxes, you are charging everyone, the innocent as well as the guilty. And what I'm arguing here is that transparency can help us to root out this cancer of corruption. Because the truth is this, there's a lot of plundering of uh, countries that takes place or mineral resources that take place and that money is that problem is not just a problem for African countries or developing countries it's a problem for us because on occasion it's our markets or our property markets or our banking institutions that are being used now the way to answer that I'd rather far rather answer that through transparency which from which the innocent have nothing to fear but the guilty have a lot to fear I'd rather answer it through transparency than by putting up taxes, because, of course, if you put up taxes, uh, you're punishing the innocent along with the guilty. Now, we have put up some property taxes, for instance, stamp duty, because that has been part of our way of making sure the richest in our country and people who invest in our country make a contribution, a big contribution, to reducing our deficit. But I think the idea of just using taxes to try and tackle corruption I think is the wrong answer to the question. Transparency, sunlight, is the best disinfectant in this, on this occasion. And that's why this register of beneficial ownership, being clear about who what I think can make a real, make a real breakthrough. One more question to go. I think we've done all the British press. Let's have someone at the back. Uh, the lady in purple at the back. Sorry, yes, Rolls-Royce. Very important investor is so important we uh... thank you very much prime minister um your messages have been very welcome and speaking um, on behalf of rolls royce who are of course very present in the uk but also now here in singapore i wondered as we've gone around with you we've heard a lot of um, reflections about the growth of asean as an organization i wondered what your reflections are on some of the lessons that can be learned from the experiences that we've had in europe particularly to help business in ASEAN? Yes. Well, it's a brilliant um, question, and, and uh, one which, which I'm definitely asked about as I go around, because as this uh, economic community, as this economic market is created in ASEAN, and I was at the uh, headquarters last night, they're obviously asking a lot of questions about how far do you go? Uh, are you just taking down tariff barriers and agreeing to common, some common actions? Or are you going further towards a full single market where you recognize each other's professional qualifications, where you recognize each other's standards and the like? And I think it's going to be, I think it's ASEAN to look at the European Union and think, well, what are the things we want to copy? And frankly, what are some of the things we want to avoid? And I think it's a useful conversation um, between the two. For, for my own wouldn't uh, want to lecture ASEAN on, on what to do. I think there are definitely benefits from creating more of a single market, from moving, allowing the movement of, of goods and services. I think for Britain, it's particularly important to recognize as a, an economy with enormous and developed services sector, that of course we want to see tariffs come down, of course we want to see the movement of goods, but it's often more complicated changes that are necessary to see the movement of services. And indeed, there's another aspect of this which is really relevant to the, business, the businesses on my visit uh, this time, which is as well as seeing uh, more services trade, so trying to make sure that in, you know, British insurance companies can sell insurance in different markets, there's also a really important conversation to have about how we regulate future industries. To take one example, uh, obviously the massive growth of social media, massive growth of mobile phone penetration means there's all sorts of financial services now available online, via Bitcoin, over your mobile phone. How we regulate those things and how countries in ASEAN regulate those things is going to make a huge difference 
to how many jobs we can create, how many services we can sell, how British companies and other companies can expand globally. So this, this free trade agenda is far more complicated than it used to be. As for ASEAN, they must make up their own minds. I know what I think needs to change uh, in Europe. We need to make sure we are more flexible, we are more competitive, we keep off uh, expensive regulation. We don't try to add to the burdens of business. That's a big part of my renegotiation uh, agenda in Europe. And I think the more that European leaders and European countries spend here in Southeast Asia and see the vibrancy and feel the growth of these countries, I think the more they'll recognize there's a danger of Europe falling behind, a danger I don't want us to fall in, and that's why that competitiveness agenda is so important. Can I thank you all again for coming? Can I thank this great university and this great public policy school for hosting me today? It's been a real pleasure and a privilege uh, speaking here, and I hope to follow up the ideas discussed in my speech. And thank you also for your questions. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>